together these three very different presentations. Actually, the three of them uh, are all about special of enlargement. One of them is sort of a success story of enlargement. It's the case uh, on the presentation uh, on Great Britain. The other one is about uh, basically enlargement used as a also a potential tool of the European foreign policy. It's the case of the presentation by Sonia. And the other presentation by Axel is about the refusal of enlargement coming from a European uh, from a European country. Uh, I didn't actually exactly, exactly see what could be common ideas uh, among them. Anyway, my, the ideas I got from the papers is this. Uh, it's very schematic, but uh, enlargement counts as a result of shocks. When there are no relevant shocks, enlargement normally doesn't happen. And it also happens when there is, a, there is a need for protection by the countries uh, that are concerned uh, surrounding the European community. So shocks and the needs of protection are common features, uh, binding together why some countries join and some countries don't, don't join the European community. Also, in fact, you can see that when there is less need, when, uh, and for example, the case of Norway is quite typical of this, when there is, the need for enlargement is less felt. So when, for example, Norway discovers that it's one of the largest oil producers in the world uh, in the 70s, uh, this huge debate of, on enlargement sort of, uh, gets less important. Um, none of the papers except, except uh, strange enough, the paper of Norway emphasizes sort of the idealistic element in, uh, uh, in, uh, in enlargement. Normally the people that argue in favor uh, of entering the European community of the European Union try not to emphasize too much of the, uh, too much the idealistic or the political the dimension uh, of uh, uh, of the issue. It's rather those that are against enlargement that uh, very much emphasize uh, uh, the political uh, nature of European integration process. And that's also why I think it's really interesting to, to study the opposition movements to European integration. Strangely enough, a lot of times they explain better what uh, is the perceived nature or the actual nature of the European uh, community rather than those who favor uh, European uh, integration. Getting uh, uh, to the single papers, uh, the paper by um, in the paper by Axel on Norway, I think the shock for Norway was the fact that Britain entered, uh, or at least tried to enter for two times uh, the European community in the 1960s. Um, so that was the shock to which uh, Norway reacted and eventually led to the potential uh, uh, entering of Norway into the European community. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a suggestion on which I would like us to maybe to expand a bit more about the fact he didn't speak on, uh, about this in the presentation, but he suggested it the few papers that he sent me, uh, of uh, studying the anti-European community movements in the 1970s as forerunners of the anti-European movements, the enormous anti-European uh, movements uh, today, of today, and also the anti-European movements uh, that uh, were very outspoken during the debates for the European Constitution. Uh, so that's I would like him to expand on it. I, I have a feeling that it's not exactly the case, uh, in the sense that
that even though so many animals were quite similar, for example, in the case of Norwegian's anti European movements in the 1970s, to those that echoed in France against the European constitution recently, I think that Europe was in reality uh, totally different in the 70s and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and recently. And that the Europe uh, of the 19th century, the European community of the 1970s, had actually quite a little grip on the national economic policies. So I, I think the anti-European movements sort of um, invented more than they actually spoke about uh, uh, the, the, the reality. Um, the surprising factor to me on your paper, Axel, is not actually that there were anti-European movements. For me, the really surprising factor is that a, a Scandinavian socialist party at the beginning of the 1970s would so much be in favor of entering the European community though the European community had always been sort of uh, not very much appreciated by the international socialist movement. So the really strange thing to me is, to be explained, is why uh, was at the beginning of the 70s the European community a potentially positive element for a socialist uh, uh, Scandinavian, uh, for a socialist Scandinavian party, and that so many Norwegians were actually in favor of joining the European community. That's what's strange to, to me more than the fact that, that there was opposition. Uh, on the paper uh, by Ferdinand, it's an excellent uh, example of, uh, I would say, diplomatic history. So basic, basically only based on the archives of the starts telling the story of the island of Fiji, Barbados, Mauritius. So I googled the, these places and uh, you can see like a wonderful uh, sand with uh, sunny beaches. It does, doesn't seem a place where you would actually uh, have uh, problems. But uh, in fact it was a very, it is a very story, telling story, the story uh, Ferdinand uh, talks about. Uh, to me, this is the, an example of a success. It's an amazing success because in the end, everybody's happy of the story that Ferdinand is saying, is telling us. Britain is happy because it finally, finally enters the, the European community. The uh, Commonwealth countries that produce sugar are happy because they get the deal they want with the European community rather than only with uh, with Great Britain and obviously even the other European countries are happy because uh, the European community uh, is enlarged to Britain. Uh, so, I mean, it's a neat story and it's also uh, a story with, with a happy ending. Uh, what would be my sort of doubts, but they are not on your paper, they're, they're more on your paper story. If this is such a neat story, uh, so Europe, the European community substitutes itself to sort of the British Commonwealth in uh, being the major interlocutor of sugar producing uh, countries. Uh, what happens next? I mean, why is it uh, that 1975 is this, uh, possibly the best, uh, one of the few successes in uh, Europe, uh, in a potential foreign policy of the European community? And then all these deals actually end up in not having uh, the success that I know it's not part of the paper, but, but that's in the end the domain invention is eventually uh, a failure from what it's, uh, it, it leads to. Um, and also I have I had a feeling when reading your paper that there's the, there are loads of articles written on Britain's entry into the European community, and none of them is quite convincing to me in explaining how is it possible that uh, 
uh, a country that scaled after the Second World War was the largest empire in the world, sort of in a few years uh, starts considering his, his friends. You remember the British Prime Ministers arguing that our friends are not in uh, producing uh, cars in Germany, that our friends are in India, uh, in uh, Atlas, or wherever, and sort of changes his mind and basically, as it's very evident in your paper, uh, considers the, the European community as being much more important than any of its links with Commonwealth uh, countries. Uh, there's been a lot of things written on that, but none of this actually takes into account uh, uh, sort of the cultural, uh, if you will, the idealistic element to this, uh, uh, to this uh, adhesion of, the, of Great Britain to the, to the European community. Uh, and they mostly take into account the economic aspects of it or not. Uh, still, I mean, by reading your papers like yours, I still feel that this abandoning of Great Britain, of the Commonwealth, uh, in order to integrate it in a way in the European community, has to be explained this better uh, than it has done. And also, the last thing, but it's typical of every paper that is written on the common agricultural policy or things like that. Uh, I would always be curious, at least in a note, to know something about actual agriculture how it works. For example, we discover that in the European community we produce a lot of sugar. Not being a farmer, I don't know how we produce uh, sugar in the European community. Sometimes, like when you write things about diplomatic history, uh, you get this sense that you want to know a bit also of how things materially work, just in order to know some more by reading the, even a diplomatic paper on the world we, we actually we actually live in. Um, on the paper of uh, Sonia, it, it was a very uh, sort of synthetic uh, explanation of uh, a huge. Uh, a huge uh, problem. Uh, and I, I, I mean, there's so many things you could say, and uh, I, I only choose among them. What struck me uh, in your selection of uh, potential uh, places where the European Union could enlarge is not only the, the countries that were there, but those that were not there. Uh, for example, now we discovered that the Mediterranean countries uh, sort of they, even though the Mediterranean can be considered a frontier, they have uh, uh, what is happening there has so many relations with, I mean, the perception of the European democracy, immigration, and so on and so forth. So, if by taking into account only those countries, uh, Western Balkans, Iceland, uh, uh, Turkey, you're actually arguing that the Mediterranean is, is a frontier. It's not one of those areas where of potential enlargement of the, of the European Union, but it's a frontier between two different uh, worlds. That's, I mean, it's a big question. What comes to, to my mind. The other thing, uh, uh, it's a danger that I perceive every time we speak about enlargement, only taking into account the procedures, the technical procedures uh, of the European Union, which set steps like step one, step two, step three, and then we discover that in the end, why is Turkey? When was the first time Turkey asked to become a member uh, uh, of the European Union? It's 1960. You, you wrote 1950. 1963. Yeah. So 
I mean, it's 1963 that Turkey has to become a community member. That's the only explanation uh, on why Turkey didn't become, uh, you, you wrote a list of them, but it's, it's so political. So it, you cannot speak about this enlargement without speaking about the politics of at least the most important countries uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, the, the Turkish e issue is entirely a, a political issue within certain uh, uh, European, uh, uh, European countries. It's not a technical issue about the procedural matters in Brussels. It's all a political um, it's sort of a political debate that has to do with so many things, but, but if you don't explain that, it's also very difficult to explain uh, the reasons for enlargement. Uh, uh, so, since this was your sort of your schematic presentation, as I would suggest to you to, in a way, engage with politics, because I think enlargement is all about politics. I, I think the the legal, the legalistic element of, of enlargement is, is actually less important than the, the, the political uh, element of it, the foreign policy, economic, and so on, so public opinion, and so on. So, uh, these were my main points. So, I don't know, uh, I guess what we could do is, uh, if you know the, the, the questions, just let's take them other questions uh, so that we can have a 10 minutes, uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, chat on your papers. Yeah. Uh, the, the
Sonia, uh, you, I love the other move you made uh, to the financial crisis and prospects for further development uh, and how it slows the process of enlargement. But wouldn't you think that perhaps the last enlargement, which I would, um, excuse me, I apologize for the language, uh, has been enough messy uh, on the institutional uh, point of view, this kind of slow, whatever prospect for any other judgment before securing the reform and the reasonable process actually. Okay, two questions for Axel. Um, in the sense that I would like to, if it's possible, to expand a bit more on the various components of this sort of intricate. Uh, 
on that on the way. Uh, you say it's surprising that the Scandinavian Socialist Party is so much in favor of joining them. Uh, true, uh, it's, it, it had been a long process uh, for all the Scandinavian Socialist Parties. I mean, the Danes were also in the same position uh, with a, a leader who was uh, also very eager to, uh, to join, but he um, had an easier loss in convincing um, his uh, effort. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this, this uh, they departed sometimes in the late 50s, they departed from the essentially negative view on, on the European continent, that uh, they started to see that well, we can actually cooperate with uh, with, their, with our partners. They are not all of them uh, dangerous capitalists, Christian Democrats, etc. Uh, and of course, for the Social Democrats in Norway, uh, this really takes on from 1765 onwards to, to to look into the more positive ways. How can they use Europe to promote the social democratic policy? In 61, 62, it's we have to go in because uh, the great, because great Britain is going in. Uh, while in, in 67 and 70, it was we can use this to promote uh, socialist policy. And that had a lot to do with internal party processes. People were uh, developing this uh, uh, deliberately, and, and it had to do with changes also uh, around, particularly in Germany, where we really don't. It was very close to. Resembles 
time when we were in, in Sweden. So that the proponents of the membership would use the uh, older words than um, that. Um, so in that way, it, it uh, um, comes into the plan.
not only what is happening now, but it's also what is happening now. Uh, what concerns to the Mediterranean area, I would not uh, go that way. Only in, and I uh, talked about the South and Caucasus, but uh, South and Caucasus and the Mediterranean area are also covered by the new good policies for those areas. It's the same uh, political instrument, but it's true, I didn't talk about that. But uh, I clearly uh, divided the instruments for enlargement in the countries where the perspective for further enlargement uh, is realistic, and the other instruments uh, like neighborhood policies, which does not give access for human membership. So uh, there are different uh, instruments. Um, connecting both uh, things, because probably you said more or less uh, things connected. Yes, uh, in one concerns to the institutional credit after the enlargement, not only the 2004, but also the 2007, Bulgaria and Romania, and by a number of not only the number of member states, but uh, some uh, deficits in these both countries also uh, increase the institutional credit and all the police making uh, in European institutions. Plus, the Lisbon Treaty, this also reinforced the previous uh, institutional enlargement credit, and I would uh, also put the different constitution constitutional framework of different member states. Let's not forget that we have member states that have to do referendums on further enlargements. And in this case, only the French uh, opposition for further enlargements is enough to blockade any other enlargements. And at the end, the assignment was the financial crisis. Uh, only after the, the previous I stated, because it's the moment that we are dealing with and only again reinforce the institutional funding, the 2004 and 2007, the Lisbon Treaty, the different constitutional frameworks of member states, and now the, the financial crisis. So it's orderly, yes, financial crisis is the, the last one. But again, I'm returning to the beginning when there will be a need, a real need to do the enlargements that will be. That will be done. I really the shock wave. Uh, shock wave. Yeah, that really, you spoke about. And uh, according uh, only to about the political uh, terms concerning the Turkish case, uh, actually, yes, I also agree because recently the Turkish Prime Minister, in a piece on the news week, clearly stated that uh, the accession process. The accession process has been facing resistance orchestrated by certain member states and 18 out of 22 negotiation counter chapters pending for discussion are blocked on political grounds. So if we see uh, that South Korea and Mexico are uh, presently offering the strategic partnership to Turkey instead of membership, of course it's uh, on political uh, grounds uh, rather than Thank you very much.